Hey everybody, Roger here. With Shofu busy uploading his Pokemon videos and Ricky out of town for the time being, I just wanted to preface this episode with the fact that we don't cover the past couple weeks of Miiverse photos this week. Uh, that shouldn't be a huge problem since the only things of note over the past couple weeks have been the Xerneas Pokeball slash stage hazard confirmation um, and Sakurai's hint that the Sonic stage that's been revealed may be something more, maybe an adventure mode stage or something like that. Good news is that we managed to grab Prague for a special full-length discussion on the recent Smash Brothers documentary and Project M updates. So we'll be back in two weeks with our regular programming schedule of Miiverse pictures and listener questions. But without further ado, I now present to you Japan Time episode 10 as it happened live on Twitch. Enjoy! <laughs> We're starting right now. Whenever you guys are ready to start, I've been ready. We're waiting for you. All right, we're ready. Oh, for me, I'm ready. Are you? Are you recording? Show Oh my god, that face. Can we just take the stream audio when it's done? If you want, yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, do you want to do that? Can yeah. you edit from the stream audio? Yeah. All right, cool. That's what we'll do then. All right then. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second segment. Uh, well, what will be the second segment when you are listening to this of Japan Time episode 10? We are now in double digits. Um, for those of you who are just joining us right now, we are live on my Twitch channel. Um, I'm your host, the lovable Roger D. Luigi, and this week I am joined by Shofu. Hi. The real Zeph, of course. Hello. Uh, excuse me? You got a little more enthusiasm, Mr. Zeph. I, I can't. You had, you, of course you can. You're, all right, whatever. Of course you can. And then, Coast, we got Coast hey! here this week. Stop. Okay. Oh, I already killed that my man. I am gonna kill this man. <laughs> Don't be a hater on your life, Shofu. Excuse me? We gotta introduce our special guest. The one and only, Mr. Prague. I just spilled ketchup all over myself. Not that at all. <laughs> nice and clean. <laughs> right, so, so the reason, the reason Prague's here, and you guys are probably wondering, Whoa, you guys got Prague, this is crazy. So, He's here to talk about something very specific, which is, and some of you may be aware of this, the Smash Brothers documentary. Wait, so, I, I thought I was talking about adopting, uh, actually, animals from actual shelters and not puppy farms. Space oh, animals. could you go into that, I guess, a little bit? Because we'd love to hear about it. Well, you know, puppy farms are really not the way to go when it comes to adopting animals. Um, there are a lot of good dogs out there that just need lovable... Wait, what are we talking about? Some of that, right? <laughs> Talking about the documentary. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm so, in the right okay, place. so, Prague, go ahead. Sort of describe for the for the listeners who maybe aren't aware of it so far. Um, what's the Smash Brothers documentary? Who's behind it? What All do right. you have to do with it? And uh, yeah, just go to talk about it a little bit. All right. So uh, instead of puppy farms, uh, we're going to talk about the efforts of one person, who in the Smash community is known as Samox, uh, real name Travis Bochamp, and he runs his own production company called East Point Pictures. Actually, if you go to youtube.com, search for East Point Pictures, you will see uh, a nine-part documentary series entitled The Smash Brothers, which is, which started out as going to be an eight-parter, if that, about the game of uh, Super Smash Brothers Melee, the competitive scene throughout all of the various eras. And Travis actually was a one-man band for all of this. Uh, he was the cameraman, lights, sound, audio, editing, quit his job, was working 14 hours a day on it, uh, all done through a Kickstarter, and he got a lot of support from the community because, again, he quit his job. Um, and it's been coming to fruition as it was released two weeks ago. Uh, it's nine parts again. It's episodic. First uh, episode has about 200,000 views at this point, um, and we're hoping that a lot more people decide to stick through the entire journey just as the people in the community have. Uh, for all these years, um, one thing, uh, that, I just not to interrupt you, but I just noticed oh, one ahead. thing too about the uh, about the Smash Brothers documentary in terms of like the uh, the wide range of appeal of it is I've I've seen that posted not only on the streams of a lot of different people who are in the Smash community, but also um, a lot of Treehouse employees, people. a lot of localization companies of different video games, and even like celebrities have been tweeting about that Smash Brothers documentary. Oh, um, Lucas, yeah, so Lucas Neff, who does uh, Raising Hope, was watching it earlier. And he tweeted uh -huh. about it. Um, there's been there's been a lot of people, honestly, who've been talking about it, and uh, oh, yeah. it's it's really cool to see sort of Smash. I know it's talked about it in the actual doc, um, but to sort of see it evolve from just this this game that people were you know 
having tournaments in their basement and inviting their friends over and then staying overnight to play Smash Brothers until six in the morning, you know, into this thing that I think a lot of people have come to respect as a sport. Yeah. Um, first, when you talk about just the number of people that have been intrigued, intrigued by it, uh, I'm still here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I thought I heard someone disconnect, so I thought it was me and I was going to freak out. All right, it's not my fault. Cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just the number of people that have tweeted about it and shown support. Uh, Bill Trinan from Nintendo retweeted it. Yep. Uh, we've had Scara. We've had uh, for all you League of Legends fans. A uh, good friend of mine, Alex Penn, who actually is a coach for Cloud9, has been raving about um, We've had a lot of Dota players. Basically, anyone that plays a game competitively has raved about it. Alex Vaya from the fighting game community. Because they all understand, you know, what it what the what that competitive drive is and especially the formation of any community they can understand they can sympathize and empathize with um and then just constantly hearing about how uh, fantastic it's been from all those people uh it's it's been certainly an eye-opener for a lot of people who we feel like smash is this really really insular community and to some degree it really is but at the same time, things like this certainly expose that we have our own history and we are we're we are are a lot more widespread than people expect. Another thing I noticed too about not just the documentary but about the community in general is that it's probably the most welcoming of any fighting game currently on any circuit. Like you can you can be playing Smash Brothers at a small as like a small town tournament and be playing against like the best guy in the world. Like, you, you could just randomly go to a tournament running in Mewtwo King, and then suddenly, you know, and suddenly you'd probably well, get destroyed. But, I mean, definitely. you still have that one-to-one -one experience. Like, I don't yeah. know of any other uh, any other fighting game where you could sort of do that, where you can connect with them on such a personal level. And, th and that everyone's so I, welcoming. You'll see the guy who placed eighth at a tournament, you know, having dinner with the guy who placed 64th with the guy who placed first, you know? Yeah, and everyone's I just mean, talking as if they're on the same level. It's... The thing about the Smash Queen that makes it different from a lot of different fighting game communities is just where we come from. Uh, we are not from the arcade scene. Uh, we aren't from that whole mindset of, okay, this is my last quarter of the day. I have to win or else I'm going home. I can't play again. We had to go to each other's houses. We had to invite people over for dinner and stuff to get our scenes going. We, we started out in this kind of family atmosphere. Um, not saying that other games don't uh, have that atmosphere, but that's where we came from. That's what we were born out of, and it's something that certainly still continues to this day. Uh, what you're talking about, about, you know, playing the guy who plays first. My first, uh, one of my first tournaments, actually, I was playing Doc Dittos with some guy. So it was his first tournament, and I said, okay, it's my, it actually was like my first or second it's like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll play some friendlies, and he proceeds to four-stock me, destroys me, wasn't pretty at all. It's like, oh, yeah, by the way, my name is Mewtwo King, I lied to you. <laughs> and by that point, you know, I had been, uh, I'd been seeing him on uh, the DC++ hub, and, you know, it, I knew him as a player, but not as a person. And I think that's one thing that the documentary did really well, was you got to figure out a lot of these players and who they are beyond the game. Especially with uh, certain episodes like Isaiah, like Mango. Oh, Isaiah's, Isaiah's was beautiful and heartbreaking and inspiring, like everything all in once. I love that was by far my favorite episode. Like just getting that insight, especially because Isaiah's always sort of had this like shroud of mystery around him. People who have like been following the game, or or you know people who um who compete and and you w want to know a little bit more about him. I don't think we've ever ever had like as much inf uh, insight on him as this documentary provided us oh, with. It was Isaiah fantastic. certainly is like a, kind of a Bigfoot figure in the Smash community because he may or may not exist at this point, but everyone is concerned, everyone wants to see him. Mm. And I think doc the documentary definitely exposed a lot more of him than we were expecting. Uh, and I feel like that was a great trend because, I mean, me personally, I've met all the individuals in the documentary. I've commentated matches for nearly... I think everyone except for Ozan at this point. And it's it's fascinating knowing them all as people. But as players it's completely different. Oh my god, absolutely look at look at KDJ. That was another oh, one yeah. that I was like completely blindsided. I had known uh, sort of about his rise, but I didn't realize 
that he he started playing. So this is something you guys will find out when you watch the documentary. Um, but the episode on a Korean DJ is fascinating. The way how he basically to get into the community said, "Okay, I'm gonna play money matches with all the best people, and I know I'm gonna lose this money. I know I'm gonna lose these matches. But by doing a money match, he sort of coaxed out of the shadows, like he used the money as bait to sort of be able to to understand how everyone plays the game. You know, what were their techniques?" Um, how to counter them. It was brilliant. It was a great tactic, and I think it, it yeah. ended up serving him really well. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the same thing with uh, what a lot of people do now. You know, they go to a tournament, and they know that they're not going to perform well, but they're entering just to get the uh, exposure, get used to that, those tournament nerves and mindset. It's You have to pay your dues, and KDJ paid them literally, and we see how, how great he did doing that. Um, but again, going back to the documentary, um, so Sam Ox did it all, um, and this was a collection of footage basically over the past two or three years. Um, the guy was extremely dedicated, rarely went to events, just because he wanted to put out something that was fantastic, and all the reviews definitely say it certainly is, certainly does fall into that category. Mm. Um, and in addition, uh, the last episode, I'm not going to spoil it, uh, he wanted to go to that event, and he couldn't just because of how uh, how deeply entrenched he was with that documentary. He had the money and everything, but he knew it was time better spent editing. So he actually had a lot of people sending him footage of uh, things from that event, even you know myself, like I had Facebook pictures that were included at some point, but it, it was just really, really fascinating to see him put that together with extremely little uh, source footage. I mean, anyone that works in television can tell you if if you don't have solid source footage, you might as well reshoot it or do whatever you can to get some. And he was able to make he was able to make a solid cake out of like the last bits of flour. And you'll see. I think that one thing that's really interesting is, of course, you're seeing the players, but just how far the technology in the game has come. Uh, you'll see a couple of early uh, video camera shots, and then coming to current day modern streams, I think for a game that's 12 years old, it's a really, really great juxtaposition. I remember the the, for the uh, video footage of East versus West, the first, like the, I think it was number two, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken, that was some of the coolest stuff, like seeing everyone sort of in their prime and seeing them so young, and that was one of the, one of the coolest moments, I think, of the whole series. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's kind of scary, you know, that so many of these people have been playing for so long. I mean, I myself... I guess I'll put myself in the 06 camp, um, but it's like still seeing guys like M2K still playing, still performing really well. Uh, seeing uh, Ken over the summer uh, trying to defend his title for something that he won six years ago, even though he's been inactive for so long. It, it was, it's just. It's really fascinating, and I think the documentary did really encapsulate that really well. That's so funny. You you talked about uh, you talked about Ken because actually we had you on episode three um, mm -hmm. when we were talking about when Evo was going on and seeing that Ken match, like without spoiling anything, seeing that Ken match at Evo this year was incredible. Like seeing this seeing this guy who you sort of saw as a legend, at least for me and a lot of people, sort of like from my class who were, um, you know, the younger group of Smash players, to see him sort of, like, out in the open and, and to be revealed to everyone who was at EVO, I think it was fascinating. It was oh, really definitely. Cool. So, I mean, right, well, again, you know, Ken was one of those guys that was, uh, he disappeared for a while, you know. He, he went on Survivor. We thought we were never going to see him again. And then for a lot of people that came in, like I'd say now, it's kind of middle school of the uh, game at this point. Um... Just having the opportunity to meet him and see him when this is a guy that we've all venerated for so long. It's it, it was just really, really it was special and I, I, I hope we can capture that moment again at some point. Who was it he played those matches with? I think it was a best of ten. Was it with Mewtwo King? Yeah. Yeah, that was that was something. Oh yeah. I mean it it it's it was great to see them playing again in the year 2013. Um, but I mean, also, you know, we had a lot of dream matches, and one of them, I guess, I talked about a bit in the documentary, 
I'm not going to mention it just so you guys can watch episode three. But uh, definitely check it out when you have a chance. Again, uh, YouTube.com, search for East Point Pictures. And if you want to follow Sam Mox on Twitter, because he is doing updates, and because this all started via uh, Kickstarter, I know he said that he actually does want to do more episodes. Uh, it's just a matter of funding, if he can get it. So uh, his Twitter is underscore S-A-M-O-X underscore. So definitely let him know what you think of the documentary. And uh, just uh, definitely thank him because he put in a lot more effort than a lot of people would expect. And I know a lot of people who are hesitant about Kickstarter, but I feel like this is one that I would absolutely back. Yeah. Like more episodes of... This is something like this and Mighty Number no. Nine. I think are the two things in history I will ever go in and give money to a Kickstarter. I just feel is more it, biased. That's all. Yeah, Zeph. Yeah, I mean, we hardly even heard from you. What did you, What did you think of the documentary? Like, what were your favorite episodes? What were some moments that really like stood out for you? Uh, Isaiah's episode, obviously, because everybody loves Isaiah's episode. But uh, yeah, it showed like how relatable Isaiah is as a person, and. Uh, that he he was he was more than just like that great player that I I, th- I kind of see him as like the face of Captain Falcon now more so than than Scar was but that's yeah just I me. sort of I do too after that episode too no, I've it's always been that way for me but I haven't seen much yeah. of him mm. so it was nice I seeing that agree. episode like uh, I feel like Isaiah and Dark Rain were the two big Falcons of that era uh, yeah. Isaiah coming a bit before, but um, Dark Rain, you know, I mean, of course you have the newer generation, we have guys like Hax, S2J, uh, Sound Spectre, yeah. but um, it's it's always going to be Isaiah for so many Falcon players, just because a lot of the stuff that he does, that he did back in, you know, 05, 06, 07, Falcon players are just now starting to implement it, and it's mostly just Hax, so... Yeah, it, I think just watching him as a player is fantastic, but getting to see someone that we venerate having the same issues that every person has, it's it's just really, really, it's really, really humanizing, and I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I think, like, in a word, if I was to describe the documentary, I would definitely say humanizing, because it's sort of giving a face and a personality to all these people who we've sort of seen as, like, legends in the community, you know? Oh, definitely. To finally see how they are and how they act, and, yeah, it's been it's been really, really cool. So, wait, Shofu, are you still there? Uh, he's, I've seen people in the stream being there. like, Shofu. He's here. He's he changing disappeared. His, he's changing his I'm, picture. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm completely ignorant to the document. I know, like, I know about it, but I haven't seen it or anything, so I don't really have any input right now. Oh. Well, see, this is that's the perfect then. Pro- Prog, it's good we had you on because <laughs> that's the perfect plug to have people who are listening to the podcast who, like Shofu, haven't seen it yet. Um, yeah, I definitely implore you to see and check it out when you have a chance. Sure. Well, while you're here, so we can huh? still hold on to you for a little bit, let's talk about Project M. Let's talk about that okay. thing that we were talking about earlier on the stream. That of course none of us know anything about Project M. Oh, no, I, I have no idea what Project M. We don't know is. who works on it and how yeah. to, you know, who promotes it. How do you even download? So do you it? and Zeph sort of do you and Zeph sort of want to go into like uh, the details and new updates and things oh, that you've sure, noticed and the new changes? Yeah, yeah sure. go ahead. Uh, so actually, I'm at a I'm at a friend's house right now. They're playing Brawl, and Boo. some <laughs> things don't change. Brawl is one of them. It's still really, really slow as yeah. I'm watching it right now. Um, and, you know, personally as a player, I'm more of an aggressive player. I like... I thrive on offense, mix-ups. If you have my back against the wall, that's yeah, I when I... Uh, that's when I... As I hear shine, 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 shine in the background. <laughs> <laughs> when my back is against the wall, I don't perform really well. And I'm, I've always put an offensive mind to player in every, every fight I've played ever since I started with Virtual Fighter. And oh. Brawl really didn't uh, mesh with me very well because it rewarded defensive gameplay and offensive uh, play. You really weren't... Offensive play actually was a hindrance to that game. What PM basically is, for those of you that are unaware, is PM is... It's kind of this amalgam of melee and Brawl, where you're taking brawl ca- you're taking the Brawl roster, and now a couple of other characters we'll talk about later on, and you are kind of modifying the brawl engine to make it closer to melee. It's not melee, it's not brawl, 
it's this amalgam. I think that's what makes it really, really special. Yeah. Um, it's, it's... It's its own uh, game, really. It's what it is. It is. That's yeah, why I've been it's its own people. game. There are a lot of Melee purists who say, you know, PM is garbage, and I'm just like, because you're putting it... You're comparing it to this game. And of course, you know, you always compare games to other in the series, but sometimes it's it's not the time or place to do that. I think PM is one of those projects because, again, it is all crowdsourced. It's a bunch of individuals in the Smash community who are trying to make Brawl something a bit more like Melee, trying to make the sequel to Melee that I think a lot of people want and expected. Mm. Um, I guess that's my PM plug right now. Do you want to go into it a bit more? Yeah. Uh, I A lot of... Okay. I'm not going to... I'm not going to try and... I don't know how to say this. I... Uh, I think Project M, if it if it wasn't, if if Project M was what Brawl is, I, I think the melee scene wouldn't uh, exist as much as it does now. Uh, I think it would, it would, yeah, it would definitely take over. Uh, recently, Mewtwo King was on a stream with the new two characters, and he says things a lot. But uh, what he said this time was, uh, "This game is is." To quote him exactly how he said it, he said, this game is, like, better. And I can see what he means because it's a fresh game, and as much as I love Melee, I I can't keep playing with the same eight characters every match. And right. the fact that there are professional Melee players in the back room that give insight, that help balance the game and provide us with patches, which Melee obviously didn't offer, it... It, it, offered patches, just you had to buy a different region of the game. Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, like, pat. well, yeah. Um, but I think Project M is is as good or a little better, or could be a little better than Melee. I mean, one thing that I find extremely phenomenal about PM is the amount of character diversity. Yeah. Uh, mm. There's character specialists for every character, and sure there are in Brawl, there are in Melee, but not to the same degree. But I think that's because of the balancing. Um, I just love that I'm able to I love that I'm able to take on people as Donkey Kong. Like, legitimately take on people as Donkey Kong. Because I know that if, it, like, in Brawl, and of course Brawl's not the most competitive game, especially compared to Melee, but um, I, Donkey Kong versus like a Meta Knight, for example, is just something that's not going to happen. Even well, if you... It's, that's like what tiers sort of exist for is like if two people of the same plane were playing with two different characters you know who would win every time like 10 times out of 10 it'd be it net better than DK, you yeah. know yeah, well, and whereas now in project m the stuff like his um his dash attack like his his new role things like oh, that, that yeah, I hope some yeah, of those yeah. things are carried i i hope badly some of those things are carried into um into into like the new smash brothers for wii u and 3ds obviously Sakurai must be aware of Project M at this point. I think there was a great quote um, by Bill Trinan on Twitter the other day, which is that if it's if there's if it's Smash Brothers related and exists on the internet, Sakurai knows about it. <laughs> yeah, I saw that tweet. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's it's a really good way to sort of describe Project M. That yeah, maybe it's not directly influencing. In fact, I'm sure it's not directly influencing um, the development oh, yeah. of the next games. But I think Sakurai is probably aware of it. And Definitely. I'd be willing to bet that he's probably watched one or two combo videos. <laughs> there, that was something else I wanted I mean, to say, was that uh, from the the Project M design standpoint, they take things like each character has something from their own game that Sakurai seemed to miss out on, like the opportunity. Donkey Kong's dash attack going off ledges like he does in Donkey Kong Country. Meta Knight's down air being the down air from uh, I think it's Meta Nightmare from Superstar Ultra. They take yeah. things from the games they're <laughs> from and add them into the game. Sakurai, ha he he could have made Meta Knight way more unique, but all of his moves are aren't from his own universe. It's just really weird that he didn't think of doing it, but they did. Yeah, I mean, also one thing that I think a lot of people kind of forget is that when you talk about any of the Smash games. They really weren't designed to be competitive fighters. So I think that's one thing that PM does have the advantage in when it comes to balancing. Because you guys are thinking about it in its competitive aspect. And also, I mean, just the influence of the internet 
Uh, Brawl didn't really have too many patches, if I remember correctly, no. especially not any uh, not any balance patches. But you guys no, are continually, not. if any, I didn't think no. it had any. Yeah, I don't think it did. But um, it had. Well, I mean, my main all my experience with Brawl was waiting to connect, waiting to connect. <laughs> yeah. Your opponent is disconnected. But um, but um. You guys certainly have the advantage there, where you can make adjustments, you can make changes. I always tell people to compare PM to like a Smash version of League of Legends because it's constantly in development. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's uh, you guys one have a big grip on the competitive scene. You understand what players are expecting or looking for, and also you guys certainly help with events. Period. And then in addition, you throw out the whole, uh, lost my train of thought, but it sounded really good in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were sort of just talking about, like, how you it's recognized at tournaments. It's recognized at stuff like Apex. Like, you can go to these different events and play it, and you really do get a feel for the community. You ha you, you can tell, like, there is a finger, you know, on the lifeline when you go to these different right. events. You could, you could really, like, you could taste the lifeblood, as it were. Because the people <laughs> that are designing it are tournament players are involved in the tournament scene in one aspect or another. But I think that's also kind of why I have a bit of a strange hope for Smash 4 and like a lot of people in the Melee community. I mean, we already, it's sounded like it is going to be a bit of a broad Melee amalgam again. Mm -hmm. But this time you have, you have uh, Namco in the mix. And of course, I've been playing Tekken since Tekken came out for PlayStation. Man. And, <laughs> They certainly know how to balance a game and to make it interesting. So. And more importantly, too, netcode. That's something oh, they're so. very good with. And that's something that oh, yeah. Brawl was horrendous at. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. I've been, playing, uh, I've been playing some Tekken uh, Resurrection, which is their free to play, and it's phenomenal. Meanwhile, I'll play like Marvel Online or AE, and it's just like, is this possible to play online, or am I just going to play against lag and lose my opponent? Yeah. I, I just think fighting games are just best played in person. I don't know. Online is obviously sure. important to certain people, but that, I think that's why Melee is so good is that everybody had to, they had to form a scene and people be, got like really close to each other by that. And then yeah. the, the community slowly became closer just because people going to different scenes and stuff. I got I got to call out this guy in the stream right now since we're talking about Bandai. This guy in the stream, his name's Jump Jumpin Johnny. Okay, just Jumpin ignore Johnny. him. He's a troll. No, I gotta say it, and it just <laughs> he just wrote Namco Bandai developing Smash Four. De facto owns Dragon Ball Z. Goku confirmed for Smash Four. <laughs> I mean, Goku is not going to be. <laughs> I've heard rumors, and if Goku's in Smash Four, I will be maining him no matter what. <laughs> I don't care. He can be the worst character in the game. I will team with Captain Falcon every tournament. And it'll be glorious. We'll lose 2-0, but I know the stream will salute us every time. Man, I, obviously no anime character is ever going to make it in, but but if one was going to be they in, I think you can do worse than Goku and Luffy, Luffy, I think. Those are like, those are good characters. I mean, they said that Snake would never be in, they said Sonic would never be in, and look where we are now. And actually, let, while you're here, while you're here, uh -oh. let's, let me ask you about something, because we had this argument last episode and Warchamp disagreed with me. A couple I of the other guys were on my side. Oh and this has God. to do with Snake. This has to do with Solid Snake. Yep. Do you think he is returning to the next Super Smash Brothers game? Why or why not? I don't think he's returning. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because as much as I would love to see uh, Solid Snake return, I have faith that... Uh, that we will end up with a, uh, I mean, yeah, of course we already do have Mega Man in there. Thank you, Marquise. Uh, we do have a uh, Mega Man in there, which and we fit trainer, but I'm kind of banking on Bayonetta. Yeah. I'm expecting oh. that to be the. I'm expecting that to be the uh, big surprise. That's the character I want the most to be in Smash Four. Above all others, really, you want Bayonetta? Yeah. That's I. I oh. That's tough for me, but I definitely would want to see Bayonetta too. I just, Bayonetta's not Namco, though. Bayonetta's Sega, right? Platinum Games. Yep. Pla yeah, but I mean Platinum's. Like, yeah, Apple, yeah, Apple. yeah. Yeah, so it's like Sega and Nintendo or whatever. So, Which would make a lot of sense then. <laughs> and also, I mean, 
Bayonetta 2 is going to be a Wii U exclusive, so right. it's a perfect way to introduce her to the audience. And honestly, I think if they're going for like a more adult-themed character, I think Bayonetta is the way to go, because as much as, as much as I love seeing Snake in Smash Brothers in the old game, like seeing people play him well, not necessarily the character, but just like seeing Ooh. people play a good uh -huh. Snake, um, there's something weird about seeing like real world grenades and RPGs and stuff shooting these characters that we know and love, you know. Um, whereas Bayonetta could use like hair bullets and all this stuff. <laughs> that's the beauty of Smash. I mean, yeah. you're 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 Mario fighting Luigi over some strange brotherly rivalry on Pokemon Stadium. You know, yeah. this was the argument that everyone had as kids. You know, who would actually win the fight? And that's what Smash embodies. And now you look at it, and I think that's the case now more than ever, because you have Mario, Mega Man, and Sonic, and there right. probably will be a fourth. I mean, that's it's just crazy. Just seeing Mega Man and Sonic in the same game is, like, enough. Like, <laughs> the yeah. two-year-old me is just smiling ear to ear. <laughs> I mean, how old are you guys? 23. Clean 22. Clean. <laughs> Every, yeah, everybody, everybody this is... This is a Pokemon show. <laughs> yeah, it's 18, it's 18 plus in here. Yeah. All right, so I'm, I'm the old man of the group. You are old man uh, prog. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, these were the three biggest faces of my childhood. I mean, not just gaming-wise, but remember, all these guys had their TV shows, too. And right. You had Jaleel White voicing Sonic. And oh, my God. These someone, are... someone just uh, linked on my Facebook page the other day. They linked the Jaleel White Sonic um the Sonic Says skit, where they're talking about oh, not cli climbing. <laughs> it's like not climbing in washing machines Whoops. or something. It's like, Tails, are your brain scrambled? Well, don't climb in a washing machine, then. It's like, thanks a lot for the obvious <laughs> advice. <laughs> I'll link um, that to the, on the Facebook ooh. page once that's later. But And I actually want to riff on something that I see in stream chat from Siege TVW. Where is Smash heading? Uh, you mm -hmm. know, we, we saw earlier this year League of Legends uh, saw at the Staples Center. And I think that's a pipe dream for anyone in any any uh, gaming community. Oh, um, that'd be amazing. <laughs> will Smash I, sell it out? I I I doubt it. I think it definitely has the capability to be a spectator sport to that degree. Oh yeah. Um, but it certainly is going to need a lot more input from just beyond the community. Uh, one thing, one thing I I do think that has uh, that's really improved, I guess, with the community is when you look at something like uh, Evo. And you, you look at the way the community came out for Smash Brothers at Evo. And then on top of that, you look at, um, I guess, sort of just the community that's built since. The community with Brawl and with Project M and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's, it's just sort of, it's sort of interesting to see how it's built. And especially now, especially with these new games, having them online, I, I think the connection to find really good players is going to be easier than ever now. So you won't necessarily have... Um, like a Korean DJ going to a tournament and putting money matches down. There will just be people who are discovered playing online. People will recognize the gamer tags and new legends will be born. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, we're seeing that with Marvel right now, actually. Right. Uh, you do have a lot of the uh, leftovers or the uh, the good, solid sentinels, pun not intended, of uh, the Marvel community from MEC2 sticking around. But at the same time, you saw Cloud805 at EVO, who was... He was kind of jeered by a lot of players as being an online warrior. And then he shows up in person, gets top eight at the Evo. It's certainly showing that uh, online play is certainly viable to kind of develop as a player. And I mean, just all the tools now to for anyone to expand. Um, I mean, back in the day, it was you had Smashboard, DC Plus Plus Hub. Now yeah. you can go on Reddit, you can go on YouTube. There's constant Twitch streams. Uh, th the possibilities are em endless, basically. Yeah, this um, this happened with Project M. Wizrobe was number one on the PM like Wi Fi ladder, even though Wi Fi is terrible. And then he came to the oh. tournament and destroyed everybody in Project M. <laughs> I think that's sort of the beauty of it though. I think that's the beauty of, of games like Smash is you have these people who come out of seemingly nowhere who just end up dominating the ranks. Yeah. Um But but another thing I think is really interesting and about the future of Smash is I think it would be in everyone's best interest. First off, I think we all could say that we want Melee back at EVO next year, right? <laughs> of course. Of course. I don't so... know about that, my friend. <laughs> but I don't know if, if I want to go back to Vegas. I, I had a horrible time with some strippers and things like that. <laughs> oh, but... All right, well. <laughs> That'll be after the call. <laughs> but 
you know, seeing seeing, uh, seeing Melee again at EVO 2014, I think it would be beautiful. And even more so, I think it would be very interesting um, knowing that we do have people who are in Treehouse or people who have previously worked for Nintendo, one of which might even be on this podcast, <laughs> um, listening to the community and, and knowing what these people want. I think it would be really interesting to see um, someone maybe bring a demo of the new games to EVO next year and maybe yeah. have the new games playable right and maybe demo stations so while people are playing melee or in between matches people could sort of see the evolution of the game as it were like maybe have it on a on 3ds's that are there maybe attached to some of those girls that they have at e3 <laughs> or or have um or even have a uh, like just demo stations like you would see at like a best buy or something like that but all playing smash brothers yeah you know you, know, you see other Ooh. you see people like skull girls who came in evo uh, or dive kick these games that um weren't necessarily on the what's the word i'm main thinking stage. About? Thank you. Yeah, they weren't on the main stage, but they were there and they were present, right? Yeah. And obviously, I don't think any of us think the next Smash Brothers game is going to be out before the next Evo. Maybe it might be. Um, there was that leaked, the leaked release date pretty recently yeah, about a May release date. Yeah. Um, well, I think at but, that point it's too late to be added to the roster. Exactly. So, but I think it would definitely be there and be present, and I think it would be an important thing to have the Smash community, who's already gathered there in the first place, to be able to test the game one on one, and, and you know, actually get to play with it hands on. Well, I mean, Sakurai, really cool. Sakurai knows about the documentary because his translator retweeted it. Yes. Oh, did he really? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good stuff. <laughs> um, but just going by that, it's it's kind of interesting as well, because. Again, going back to the documentary, this is a cool segue, ladies and gentlemen, and wrapping everything and pulling everything together. You go. Um, back to the Smash Doc, again. Um, since the Smash Doc, I've been uh, talking on Twitter with uh, Sundance from MLG. And he said, you know, Nintendo of America sounds like they have some interest in working with MLG again. So if, just from that, if things do come to fruition, it certainly sounds like Nintendo might want to have a bit of a hand in the competitive scenes direction, which I think would be phenomenal. Oh, and what God, a lot of people that. wanted to begin with. Um, I mean, the last time that Nintendo acknowledged our community it was saying, okay, you guys can actually have a stream. Those were jokes, XOXO. But um, it's, I think that's what a lot of people definitely want to see. They want us to have Nintendo have a hand in the community to um, some degree. Um, or at least acknowledge the. F I mean, I think they sort of did by by allowing it to go on Evo, you know. But but uh, you know, at least acknowledge it. After a different kind of acknowledgement. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I think I think that sort of wraps up the talk about um, about the doc and about right. Evo and community stuff. Project M. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about? We've got Prague here. It's now the chance to ask a question. If you guys don't want to do anything. I have to actually just use the washroom really terribly bad. So I'm going to put Adam on the microphone. Oh, God. Uh, please, anything oh, but that. Oh, God, here we go. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, pal. What's Adam going to be talking about? Let's hear. Hello? Oh, no. Okay. Oh, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things that I wasn't really able to say when you guys were talking about. The, um, the rising of Smash right now. Uh, Smash really isn't going to be going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, I just recently read... Get this man off the mic. Get him um, off the mic. What is no, this? I, I just recently read on like my Facebook or something like that that my local monthly tournament had 20 new entrants um, today. And that's surprising. And I think it's partly due to the Smash Dot bringing in some hype and Evo bringing some attention to it too. So it's really great to see newcomers trying to come in into the scene and making a name for themselves. Yeah, and even by that, even by extension of that, uh, the same thing. We've seen a lot of old players coming back uh, because of the documentary. Because, yeah, you know, you can play other games, you can move on with your life and things of that nature, but Smash is kind of like the Mafia. The further away you kind of get, uh, the further away you try and get just into even more deeply entrenched. Yeah, like today... I saw um, Chillin' Dude and Chudat playing that doubles match today at, uh, uh, at a Smash Bros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, those are two extremely old legends, as you guys will find out from the Smash Doc. Uh, they've been around since basically the first hour, I would say. And it's, it's great seeing them again because everyone, everyone leaves at some point. I mean, I just came back from my own hiatus, but uh, 
everyone comes back eventually, and it's always great to see everyone again. These are family reunions for the community. Oh yeah, especially in, like like we said earlier, like when we were talking about the documentary, it gives a face to some of those people that you see, you know, ranting and raving on Smashboards. You get you get to see these people. One of the one of the most interesting segments was uh, when wife was talking about Ken for the first time and about he just like was an asshole, <laughs> like all the things all the things he was saying on at Smashboards and everything. You know, Twitter? that was that was one of the most interesting parts sure. about the documentary too. Is about like hearing other players. Hello, what's going on? Is that Zeph? Did Zeph just steal the mic from Coast? Hello? Thank you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we were just in the middle of I was talking to Coast about something, and then you come back and you and you leave him. Good uh, job. Okay, Zeph. okay. What, what were you guys talking about? What <laughs> <laughs> See now Coast you ruined it. No. Wait, what did I ruin? What no, 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 no. I've ruined it. What 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 were you talking to him about? Like most of his uh I'll translate. Or translate? Yeah, sure. Let's translate. So good at life. Um, but I guess while we're... I'll do my quick plugs, and then I'll stick around for some more questions and stuff. Sure. Yeah, right, for right. sure. Absolutely. So, so again, my name Shrug, is... where can we find you? Oh, oh. I was going to do the whole thing. I've got, I got a script for this, my friend. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a professional. It's a prog question, but anyway. Uh, All right. Hi, 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 hello. There you go. Nice and easy. Uh, my name is Prog. I'm a uh, commentator in the SBM scene. If you saw Top 8 at Evo, I happen to have the honor and pleasure of doing that. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Progducto, P-R-O-G-D-U-C-T-O. Also, I'm uh, kind of a veteran of the uh, podcast thing myself, as I'm part of Melee and On Me which is a bi-weekly uh, Smash Brothers Melee-oriented podcast. Uh, you can find us on twitch.tv slash Melee on me, or also on Twitter at Melee on me. Um, also, I will be... My next major event will be an Apex Qualifier, which is one of the most venerated series on the East Coast, entitled Revival of Melee. This will be the sixth iteration. I'll be doing that in November, and then, of course, if you guys are familiar with New Jersey, uh, my condolences. However, of course, I will be at Apex, which is in the middle of January, which is basically the uh, the big one when it comes to Smash. That in Genesis, sure but uh, we'll see that. Um, that's something you just mentioned Apex, and I think that's something we should actually talk about too. I think we're all going to be at Apex, right? Yeah. I think of all of Japan time is going to be there. Oh, oh not bad. We're going to do a live show then. You heard it here first. Live well, show from Apex. Nice and powerful. If you guys are going to do a live show, we might have to do some cross breedings. I know certainly the oh, Melee and Omni team will be oh there as well. Oh my goodness. Melee and Omni X Japan time. You heard it here first. <laughs> that's what well, we're going to be doing. Of, uh, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, Melee and Omni Japan. Melee and Omni Japan. <laughs> Japan and Omni? Japan it on hey, on. that actually sounds good. Japan it on me. That sounds pretty good. Alright. Well Prague, Prague, thank you so much, seriously, for joining us this week. It's always a pleasure and an honor, and anytime you guys uh need to uh add a fresh face, um you should look for someone else. I'm not as fresh anymore. But uh <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it is. And then where where can we find the rest of you guys? Uh you can find us all on Twitter. Uh you can follow Mango at Mango with a zero, then an underscore afterwards. Scar sure is at Bobby that. Scar. He's also the uh, the fresh face at Twitch.tv, so you guys can uh, find out about some of his journeys over there. People's Champ. Uh, yes, sir. People's Champ, capital P, capital C. He is the new global Twitch mode as well. Um, we also have Sheridan, aka Doctor Z, who doesn't use Twitter because he's old. And then you have. Uh, <laughs> Cactus, who doesn't tweet very often, who's at Cactus Smash. And finally, if you guys are fans of Melee and PM, you probably saw the Big House 3 two weeks ago, which was hosted by our very own Juggle Guy, who was at Juggle Rob. All right. And then, Zeph, where can we find you? Oh, uh, at the real Zeph. That's it. Nowhere else. Nowhere else. Sho I'm going to say it before Shofu says it, because he always says, I don't have a Twitter. Twitter. You, don't, you have a Twitter. Stop it. His Twitter is at official Shofu, and you can find Shofu on his channel. And you're probably listening to this on his channel right now too. If you're not on the uh, the, the, the blah, blah. if you are not on the Twitch stream, you are probably listening to this on his channel. Um, 
And then coast, we get, where can we find coast? I don't even, do people Fish care? Fish Shoku too. All right, there we go. And then you could find me um, at Rogers Base on Twitter. And actually, you could also find me on my Twitch channel right now too, which is at Rogers Base, which is where you are listening. So all these people who are in the live stream, better follow me. Where do we get on following me? Um, and then you know what? I'm seeing a lot of people talking about it in the stream. How about we make the hashtag of the week, Japan it on me? Oh, I, I, I'm not gonna say anything against it. Hello? All right, you got. We gotta hear some support. I can't just be speaking to myself. <laughs> sure. All right, that's what we're doing. And actually, we also apologize for the lack of Mr. Ricky Cocaine in this segment, as we have no idea where he is right now. So um, we still don't know. I killed him. I put him. Story next week. I put him behind bars. Actually, uh, I actually spoke to him before he got here. He said he really, really liked the uh, Smash documentary. But he wanted to do something that wasn't mentioned in it. Uh, he did want to talk to uh, Ken, find out how to live in Africa. I think he's there right now, wrestling an antelope and trying to get its meat. So we'll see about that. <laughs> Someone is a listener of our show. <laughs> oh, we got to bring Baba Tunde back wherever he is. He died. Baba he yeah, didn't Baba die. We got to bring in a new character. <laughs> Baba Tunde died from eating a hamburger cheese sandwich. That's right, hamburger cheese sandwich. What? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even want to know. No, you don't. Well, you go back and listen to the last episode. All right, well, thank you guys so much for listening. Um, it was what I guys... missed? <laughs> oh my goodness. What? <laughs> missed the whole show. <laughs> uh, I had to go outside because uh, my food was here. Oh. You were playing Pokemon is what you were doing. No. Nope. The entire episode. I mean, um, I was, but that's not why I wasn't here. Not why. All right, well, guys, you can catch us again in two weeks. Um, we'll be talking about me versus posts and things like that. I don't know. I was going to plan to just have this as like a segment at the end of the show, but this actually went the full hour. Yeah. Late. So I think this, this is going to be the show for the week. I think this was really good, especially to have Prog on. I mean, special edition right here. So I think right. it, it well, works pretty well you. too for as our, uh, as our double digit episode. So we'll be back again in two weeks with episode 11. Hopefully Ricky will be back from his, uh, his trek away <laughs> from the States and, uh, and we'll be able to talk about, and honestly, you know, people are probably going to talk about this in the comments or whatever. I think it's okay that we skipped to the Miiverse pictures this week. I think that's all right, because yeah, there was there really was nothing. nothing. Yeah. There was nothing for, like, three weeks. And hopefully, since it's been, it'll be a month by that point, we might have a new character by then. So here's hoping episode 11 we might be talking about a new character Tune and new reveals. Next week for the new like, character. So. There you go. You heard right. it here first. Next week, new character. Next week. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll be back in two weeks. All right. Wait, before we go. Huh? Huh? What? Before we go. Yeah. Sounds to Roy and me to in Project M3. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. There it is. M game. There it is. Shout outs to Roy and me too. Good night, everybody. Shout outs to Killing Coast. All right. Oh, All right. goodness. No.